Hey everybody, welcome to LaCarner's Apocalypse 2020 version. Uh, it is a bizarre and strange time that we find ourselves in right now. Um, and I hope that we can help each other out, do our part, and eventually come out, you know, relatively unscathed and see some semblance of normalcy return to our lives relatively soon. Um, I want to start by saying how bummed I am for all of my seniors whose senior year has been utterly upended by this. Your sporting events, your seasons have either been canceled or postponed. Um, and I know how important that is to many of you. Um, and I'm really sorry that this has happened. Um, it sucks. It's not fair. Um, and my heart goes out to you. Um, I know pretty much everything is up in the air right now, including things like capstone, prom, graduation, all of these things are question marks in your lives right now. And frankly, they're question marks in my life. I don't have any real answers for you yet. I am hopeful that in the coming week or so, we will get some guidance on these things. Um, but for now, let's do what we can to finish out the semester with some some good stories. Um, I think that uh, you're going to enjoy the, the, the last three short stories that we're going to share together. Um, today we're going to be talking about detective fiction, the most popular fictional genre in the world right now. For the first time, it has surpassed romance uh, as the most popular genre in the world, um, in every country. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of introductory information about the genre itself where it started and how it has evolved over the course of history. Um, if you think about shows like Sherlock, of course, is probably the most uh, famous right now, um, but Criminal Minds, Mindhunter, True Detective, um, any number of television shows on Netflix today um, involve a detective or detectives trying to solve crimes. Um, it is a genre that has evolved, um, but there are consistencies that stay with these stories throughout. Um, and we're going to look at the origins of those consistent elements um, and also how different writers, different filmmakers, different TV producers have departed from those original sort of ideas that were laid out in the very beginning. Um, from there, I'm going to transition into a PowerPoint presentation that I've created uh, about Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Many of you have heard me mention probably that Poe invented the detective story. Uh, in 1841, he wrote a story called Murders in the Room Ward, which you're going to be reading shortly. Um, and that is considered by pretty much every scholar out there to have been the very first detective story ever written. So pretty cool to be able to say I invented a genre. Um, and in that story, uh, he creates a formula for a detective story that authors and TV shows and directors, um, screenwriters have utilized over the course of history um, to tell their own version of a story. And we're gonna examine Poe's formula, the elements of the, uh, of the formula itself. And the reason why this is important, um, not only in understanding and, and when you watch detective fiction after having done this unit, you'll see these elements come out, but it's also important for your final assignment. Um, you're going to be examining the ways in which newer detective shows, uh, you, you can choose a show or a film of your choice, um, and you're going to examine the ways in which that particular author uh, or screenwriter or director has utilized Poe's formula, but also the ways in which he or she has departed from or modified Poe's original formula. Um, so for now, we'll leave it at that, um, and I want to talk about detective fiction. So let's go into the genre. All right, welcome back. I want to talk about the detective fiction genre. Uh, detective fiction concerns itself with examining in minute detail and from a very logical perspective uh, the investigation and solution to a crime, most often murder. Um, which has been committed or revealed through the course of the plot. Um, the crime, while it is typically murder, can be any number of, of the major crimes. 
uh, abduction, adultery, fraud, seduction, forgery, rape, arson, impersonation, theft, larceny, any of the big crimes. The bigger the crime, the more drama, and the better it is for um, the, the genre of crime uh, of detective fiction itself. Murder is, of course, the most suitable crime because it is obviously the most dramatic. Someone has lost his life. Uh, but it also provides the greatest number of possibilities for a battle of wits between the detective and the criminal, which at the core of every good detective story, that's what you find, is an intellectual battle, um, often a psychological one as well, between the detective and the criminal. And when you have a murder investigation, that is the height of that kind of intellectual psychological battle going on between those two characters. Um, and it's the highest stakes, right? So the detective um, is a sort of fabled role now in, in literary and just in fictional studies in general. Um, and if we look at the detective as a, a sort of um, protagonist in a story, um, a crime when it is committed is disruptive. It takes our normal life and turns it upside down. Um, and where the crime is disruptive, the detective restores order. Um, if the crime is seen as a damage to the social fabric of society, the detective is there to repair that tear in the social fabric. Um, if the crime or the criminal represents an illness, um, a sickness in society. Uh, the detective is the doctor. Um, the crime can also be the introduction of the irrational to an otherwise rational world and an uncertainty in an otherwise certain world, right? When you watch detective fiction or if you read a detective novel, one of the hallmarks of the genre is uncertainty. You don't know what's gonna happen or what has happened, right? And people who, um, are, who find themselves in a society where crimes are being committed, especially in a serial criminal, for example, there is uncertainty. And the solution of that crime and the apprehension of that criminal brings back certainty to an otherwise uncertain world. Um, and that norm that existed before the crime started uh, is restored. And so the detective can be seen not only as a sort of intellectual, psychological kind of character, she or he is also a hero of sorts, if you look at them from the right perspective. So they have to wear a lot of hats. Um, they have to possess a lot of personalities in order to be able to catch a criminal, and we're gonna talk more about that uh, a little bit later. But a, a, a good detective has to adapt to the times in which he or she finds himself or herself um, and the culture in which he or she is working. Um, so they have to be very malleable, they have to be flexible. And there are two principal types of detective that have been created uh, over the course of the years. The first is the private eye or the amateur detective, the most famous of which, of course, is Sherlock Holmes. He considers himself to be a consulting detective. He's not formally employed by the police department, but his role is unquestionably a detective, but he just happens to not get paid for it. The other one, the true detective or law enforcement official, is the other kind of detective that we find in these stories. So one is a real cop and the other one is not, but they both do the same types of things. Um, being a private detective or an amateur detective uh, poses some hurdles that a real cop might not find in his or her daily life. Um, and the three major authors who have created the most legendary detectives in history are of course Edgar Allan Poe, whom we're gonna read first, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who invented and wrote all of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and Agatha Christie, the famed British author, uh, who is the greatest selling novelist of all time. That tells you a little bit about how widely read detective fiction is today. So let's get into the PowerPoint now. I'm gonna talk about 
Edgar Allan Poe a little bit, give you a little bit of background about him, and then we're going to talk about in that PowerPoint presentation uh, the formula that he has created that has been borrowed, modified, in some cases bastardized, uh, over the course of the last 150 years. So let's go to that. Okay, everybody, here we are with the detective story formula, according to Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to a formula that was created by Poe and has been borrowed and modified and bastardized over the course of the last 150 years um, so that you will have a foundation upon which to build your argument for your final paper. So this um, slideshow is really important and I will be putting the slideshow up with my notes on um, Google Classroom. So let's start. The situation is the very first thing that we enter. When we enter uh, a detective story, there are there, there's a universe, a world that we're entering. And Poe has laid out a formula for two particular types of stories. One in which the criminal is known and in which the criminal is not known. So if we know the criminal, the only thing we need to do is prove that he or she did it. Sounds simple enough, but you've seen enough detective stories to know that simply isn't the case. If the police know or if a detective knows that somebody did it and can't prove it, there's usually a really good reason for it, and they're hiding something. The more common type of story, however, is when the criminal is unknown. We open the story with a murder scene, for example, and there's evidence and clues and things that we have to find um, along the way, but the job of the detective is to find the identity of the killer and the motive, if there is one. The next thing that the situation involves is the type of story that is being told. And Poe gives us two, again, two types of stories. The first is the grotesque murder. We've seen plenty of CSIs or SUV, um, SVU, yeah, Special Victims Unit, yes, um, plenty of SUVs as well. But um, those kinds of stories where you have really graphic, violent deaths or crimes being committed, uh, movies like Seven or Silence of the Lambs or uh, shows like Dexter, uh, Mind Hunter, things like that. Those are those fall into the category of the grotesque murder. And the second is the political intrigue mystery, both of which Poe wrote, um, and we'll be reading both of these stories. But the political intrigue is essentially, you know, any Bourne movie or any Mission Impossible story, House of Cards, Jack Ryan, JFK, V for Vendetta, anything that involves politics and crime. That is um, that falls under that category. And lastly, I want to mention something about the victim. Um, what you'll notice in the Poe stories, both of them, is that the victim, we know very little about them. And this was on purpose because the, when Poe was writing, um, he sought to offer very little information about the victim on purpose because he felt that it would be too emotionally charged for readers. And you have to remember that, you know, he invented this, this, this genre. And so we're talking about 1841. Right now in our current society, when we watch a detective sto show, we expect to be brought in to the story emotionally. We expect to be asked to identify with the victim. But that was not the case when Poe was writing. He, did, he wanted to distance, in, in a way, protect the reader from being too emotionally attached to the victim. So we learn very little about Poe's victims in, uh, in these first two stories. So that's the sort of situation. We have one of two types of main crime, you know, where we, we know the criminal or we don't, and we have a grotesque and violent crime or a subtle 
perhaps less violent but more insidious kind of crime happening in the political intrigue mystery. And then we know, uh, again, very little about the, the victim on purpose. So once we get into a story, we find that they follow a very particular pattern of action. And that leads us to the next slide. So six steps in this pattern, and the first is the introduction to the detective, and then we, we learn about the crime and the clues, and then there's the investigation itself. And after the investigation is concluded, we get an announcement of the solution. Um, this is a very particular one, and I'll talk more about that when we go through each one of these, but um, that is followed by an explanation of the solution almost always by the detective himself or herself. And then finally, something called the denouement, or the winding up or the tying together of all of the loose ends within the story. So let's begin with the introduction to the detective. Detectives, beginning with C. Auguste Dupin, who is the detective in Poe's stories, uh, all the way up to CSI Miami and just about any television show, Dexter, for example, uh, detectives are oddballs. They are um, really, really smart and very bizarre, usually. And the introduction to the detective in all of these stories is something that establishes the tone for the rest of the uh, story. And so we get to know the detective, we get to know the abilities, the intellect, the idiosyncrasies, the often bizarre habits, uh, the weirdness of the detective. Um, they're very strange characters, usually, by society's standards. Uh, they're othered. They're outsiders. They don't socialize well. Think about Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, for example. He's a hot mess in society but he's a genius at the same time. So the first thing that we get uh, in the introduction to the detective is a sort of depiction of the detective himself or herself. Then we get what we call the break in the calm. As I was saying earlier in some of my introductory remarks, if a crime disrupts the everyday life, and the detective's job essentially is to restore that norm, re restore that sanity, re restore that calmness. The, the, the crime is a disruption not only to society, but to the detective's life as well. So we usually get the police coming in, in the case of Sherlock or in the case of Dupin, uh, coming in and saying, hey, help us, we've got this horrible crime and we really need your help, we're unable to solve it. And what this does is it, it depicts the, not only the crime as an intrusion on the norm, but it also emphasizes the ineptitude of the police. They're unable to solve the, the, the crime, so they need help. Um, so there are lots of reasons why we get to meet the detective in the way that we do. It sets the tone, and it also sets the, the detective apart from the rest of society as this sort of idiosyncratic genius savant, almost, who has this sort of supernatural ability to see and observe things that the rest of us simply can't. So intro the detective is the first step. The second step in the progress is the crime itself. This is the part of the story where we get the details. We arrive, just as the detective does, at the scene of the crime. We get the nitty-gritty details, the, the crime scene montage, which you've seen in a hundred different crime show episodes in your life, I'm sure. We get to see from the detective's perspective what happened. We go through various clues that are left uh, that our detective has to work with. Uh, in some cases, there are, there's lots of evidence, and in other cases, there's hardly any at all. 
But whatever clues there are, that is, those clues are established in this initial sort of crime scene montage. The crime, as I noted earlier in my remarks, is usually something major, murder, kidnap, rape, um, larceny, I, uh, arson, you know, any of the, the major sort of highly dramatic crimes make for the best stories. So that's usually what writers use. Um, and often, particularly in the earlier detective stories, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and, and, and Poe for sure, the crime is usually overtly on its face very complex. Uh, Poe invented something called the locked room dilemma, which you are going to find out about when you read Murders in the Room Morgue. It seems like an impossible case to solve, so it's overtly very, very complex. But to the detective who has the uncanny ability to observe things in ways that nobody else can, it isn't perhaps as complex as we think it might be. So that is the introduction to the crime itself. And from there, we move on to the investigation. The investigation is the dirty work. This is where the detective digs through the evidence, interviews witnesses. Um, it's now famous. We see it in every crime show that you've ever seen. It's the cork board on the wall with all of the photos and the strings going from one image to another and the documents and all of that, trying to tie it all together. That's the, the, the dirty work, the heavy lifting of the detective. And the witnesses, often for us as audience members or readers, uh, tend to be very, very confusing. And you'll, you'll see what I mean when you, when you get into Murders in the Room Morgue. Um, and this is where the detective's abilities as an analyst, as a, an observer, really shine through, right? Um, everyone else is confused. There are red herrings, which is a, a false lead. You've seen this in, in 100 shows as well, where the detectives show up at so-and-so's house, and they interview him, and then there's an alibi, and so, um, or they interview somebody, and he doesn't have an alibi, and he looks really, really suspicious, and we're all thinking, you know, as we're sitting there on the couch, oh, it's got to be him for sure, and then it ends up not being that person. Um, that's a red herring. Um, the investigation also often threatens a character, and it's usually a character that we have been made to sympathize with, whether it's uh, a witness or somebody who's just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and so the solution to the crime itself will not only exonerate that person that we have come to like or come to care about as a character who might be under suspicion falsely, um, but it also obviously brings it, you know, all together and the, the crime gets solved. So that is the investigation part of the pattern. The next is the announcement of the solution. When the solution is announced, this is what we call the first climax of the story. It's that moment where the reader finally starts to see the evidence, to see through the eyes of the detective. And it's often uh, a declaration or a statement by the, de by the detective that he or she has it figured out. But it's not that aha moment that comes later in the story. And this is essential because it establishes that our detective is smarter than the police and has figured it out first, or if he or she is a member of the police, is smarter than anybody else on the police force. And usually, not always, but usually they've figured it out before we have as readers or viewers. And it's, it's essentially the detective's opportunity to flex on us, right, intellectually, uh, by, by declaring, okay, I've got this all figured out and I'll explain it to you in a minute, which comes in the next step. Um, 
And it doesn't mean that we've caught the criminal yet by any means, but he or she, the detective, knows who did it and why. And the announcement of the solution comes right before the explanation, which comes next. Okay, so the explanation that we get is that last scene where the detective is explaining it to someone else in the story, but really he or she is explaining it to us as readers or viewers. The answer has been there the whole time. We've seen or known about that little piece of evidence, that, that little nugget that, that we overlooked because we're not as observant as the detective. Um, and it, the explanation asks us to look at all of that evidence from a slightly different angle. And the detective, of course, as I mentioned last time, reveals his true intellect, how superior he is or she is to, to us as viewers. The clues often come over the course of the story in a very erratic way. There's nothing chronological about um, the clues that we get, the evidence that we get, but the explanation part of the formula realigns them so that they make sense not only to the detective, who has been watching them all along, but to us as readers. This is where the detective essentially explains to the sidekick or to uh, the police, if it's not a police member, who is always his or her intellectually inferior sidekick, um, the, how things unfolded. And the criminal is often the least likely person who has no relationship with the audience at all, at least in a really good story. When you get the explanation, the reveal, and you kind of knew about it, that's probably not a great detective story. Um, so this particular part of the formula is critical in revealing the surprise, essentially, which comes in the aha moment, which is the last bit of Poe's formula. This is what we call in French the denouement. When all of the loose ends come together, everything is explained in great detail. Right? This is when we learn all of it. Not only who did it, but why and how the solution of the crime. Uh, sometimes there's a trap that gets set up on the part of the police or the part of the detective to entrap the criminal. Um, but the thing about classic detective fiction, as opposed to current contemporary detective fiction, right? we want justice. In, in the shows that we watch, in the books that we read today. We want that criminal to be punished, to get what he or she deserves. But when Poe invented the genre, he was way more concerned about the psychological battle between the detective and the criminal. And so catching the person and identifying the guilty party, that was the focus of the story. And also to, to reveal the motive why did you commit this crime? And throughout the, the, the previous step, the explanation, we get all of that um, explained to us in a very sort of hand-holding kind of way. Uh, and the aha moment at the very end is where everything comes together, everything is crystallized and comes into focus in a way that we haven't been able to focus previously. So. Those are the steps to pose detective fiction formula. So use the uh, slides as part of your analysis when you're not only when you're reading Poe's stories and, and the other story that we're going to read, but also when you're writing your essay for, for the final paper. So that's it for now, and I will see you soon.